Just a word of caution, this podcast does contain material related to sexual assault, which could be upsetting to some listeners. Please make sure you're emotionally resourced and seek help from a trauma specialist or medical professional if you need it. The experience of trauma is an experience of having your boundaries incredibly violated, right? You don't matter as a person to the perpetrator. Hi, and welcome to Slut or Not the Podcast. Tell to me straight, don't leave out a word, don't leave out anything you think I should have. I'm Kelly Shoker, and I'm the director of Slut or Not, The Diary of a Rape Trial, which is a feature-length documentary film exploring what it is like to report rape and following activist Mandy Gray as she fights to change how victims of sexual assault are treated by the criminal justice system. You can also find the show notes related to this episode on our site and more episodes of Slutter Nut the Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and on our website at www.slutternut.ca. We're going to be talking to experts in the field of sexual assault and also to people who have experienced sexual assault. And if you'd like to share your own story of sexual assault, gender-based violence, or your expertise on the legal system or trauma related to sexual assault, and you'd like to be a guest on our podcast, please email us at slutornutthemovie at gmail.com. Uh, you can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Slut or Not the Movie, and please subscribe to our YouTube channel where these podcasts will also be posted. In this episode, I have a very special guest. I wish that everyone could have the opportunity to sit down with this person for an hour or two and have a chat because she's truly amazing. I'm talking about Farzana Doctor, who is a private practice psychotherapist specializing in trauma and working from an anti-oppressive perspective. She uses psychotherapy, hypnotherapy, and mindfulness training to help patients on issues ranging from sexual abuse to drug addiction, and also to work on relationships, including monogamous, non-monogamous, and polyamorous relationships. Um, She's also a registered social worker and a writer. Um, Farzana has written three books, Stealing Nazarene, Six Meters of Pavement, and All Inclusive, and she was named one of CBC's books, 10 Canadian Women Writers You Need to Read Now. She also curates the Brockton Writers Series. Uh, So let's hear from Farzana Doctor. I'm Farzana Doctor, and I'm a registered social worker in private psychotherapy practice. I've been in private practice for 12 years. Definitely violence and relationships and sexual assault uh, come up in my practice quite a bit. But I started working in this field, I think, in 1990. My first job was working at Interval House in Hamilton, which is um, a shelter for abused women. And I just realized that I really enjoyed the social justice component of social work. I wanted a job where I could also be a bit of an activist. I work with a variety of people. I work with people who identify as women, people who identify as men. I work with people who identify as transgender and transsexual as well. The experience of trauma is an experience of having your boundaries incredibly violated, right? You don't matter as a person to the perpetrator. So psychotherapy is is like counseling, except you're going probably just a little bit deeper. I think any therapist who's working with someone who's been sexually assaulted, they need to have a trauma-informed perspective, first of all. So what that means is really understanding how trauma works, how it affects the body and the mind, how it affects thinking, how it affects emotions, PTSD. There isn't a one-size-fits-all kind of approach, but Uh, One of the benefits of psychotherapy is that you can explore how the trauma impacted you on a pretty deep level. You can take a look at whether you're having, um, if if there's an interaction between past experiences of trauma and present experiences of trauma and and kind of moving, moving through the body as well. That's something that you often do with psychotherapy is you notice what you're feeling in the body and, you know, what does that mean to you? So it's it's a bit of a, a deeper kind of sinking down, sitting with emotions um, kind of experience. And we need to do that to be able to understand how trauma is affecting us. But generally, the kinds of things that will happen for people after an assault is they'll experience a lot of shock and self-doubt, self-blame, 
Um, later on, they might experience mood issues like depression. They might have intrusive kinds of flashbacks, anxiety and situations that remind them of the assault. They might uh, have a real guardedness around future relationships and that will uh, interfere with relationships. They might have difficulties around sexuality and really experiencing a full sexuality. What I really focus on is understanding that there are stages of trauma treatment and not moving uh, too fast. So it's very important that pacing is really honored because the initial experience of trauma is one where a person is overwhelmed, emotionally, psychologically overwhelmed. And so the therapy experience can't replicate that. So you wanna, you wanna maybe push the envelope just a little bit emotionally. You wanna talk about the important stuff that needs to be talked about, but not to the point that someone's nervous system is collapsing in front of you. I think it's really important that when you're talking about trauma as well, that you have an understanding of like, how does the adrenal system work? Why is it that people wanna shut down? Why is it that people wanna withdraw from therapy sometimes? Why do people sometimes want to do the opposite? Why do they want to overshare? You have to have an understanding of how trauma and the, and the nervous system works. Um, when we experience a scary situation, a life and death kind of situation, we have a few general responses, fight, flight, freeze, and collapse. These are very normal. This is what our brain wants us to do. This is how we've evolved. You know, you might have a situation where you're experiencing a trigger. So you're in a place where that is very similar to maybe where you were assaulted, for example, or the same song is playing or whatever. So you might have a flashback, right? And so in that, in that moment, you might have any of those fight, flight, freeze, collapse responses. It could last just for the minute and you might be able to come back. You might have someone helping you in that moment to help you come back. Or it could last quite a while if you're you're not in a situation where you can access help. So we need to understand uh, when we are in our own scary situation, what, what is our most common response? And if we're having a collapse response, we don't want to be hard on ourselves about that. We want to be able to say, this is a human response. This is an adrenal response. How do I take care of myself? I think it's the therapist's responsibility to moderate all of that, right? Because when you're in your own hard situation, it's really hard to think about, am I getting too overwhelmed in this moment? Am I oversharing? Am I withdrawing? Like you're just in your own experience. So I think the therapist's responsibility is to be checking in and kind of noticing what's happening with the client's central nervous system. But the other part that's kind of important is that therapists need to have an anti-oppression perspective as well. So what that means is helping clients kind of understand the connection between personal experiences and the political context in which we live. You know, what does it mean, for example, to be a woman in society? Um, how does race intersect with that? How does class intersect sexual orientation and gender identity and so on? So basically helping people to understand how the oppressive experiences that they encounter in society are not their fault. It's part of a larger uh, social construct that's impacting on them. That's particularly important when it comes to sexual assault because uh, we need to understand rape culture, right? We need to understand um, a patriarchal court system, for example. People uh, talk quite a lot about relationships and uh, difficulties that they experience in relationships, including abuse and violence, emotional or verbal abuse uh, impacting them in a way that is uh, much deeper sometimes than um, a sexual assault. And we don't know exactly why one type of violence will impact a person in a deeper way. Um, it's, it's really about how overwhelming the experience was in the moment and uh, whether we had any support to deal with it how resilient we felt afterwards. So yeah, so it's not, there isn't really a hierarchy. People also need to talk about some of those other things that I mentioned earlier, how the structural oppression of the world impacts on their mood, for example, how it impacts on anxiety, depression, that kind of thing. In general, uh, trauma therapy, the, the first stage is a real kind of stabilization stage, making sure that a person is able to kind of function and live in the best way that they can. So that involves um, teaching a lot of grounding, teaching a lot of self-care, um, encouraging people to 
take care of themselves and build their communities and their resources. There's often a lot of um, education in that stage as well. So psychoeducation about how our bodies react um, when we experience trauma. Um, also, um, I think it's what I was saying earlier about reminding people that um, this is this is a structural, this is this is a this is a societal experience that involves a lot of uh, oppression. So that's kind of the first stage. And then the second stage, and some of these things um, overlap, the second stage is actually talking about the trauma, uh, really understanding what happened, kind of going back and understanding it from um, a point of view of maybe being, um, of having a little hindsight. Um, so um, being able to understand what meanings were, was I making in the moment that this was happening? Because sometimes that's only part of the picture when we're when we're in the experience of being victimized, we're only able to have a partial experience, right? And so it's it's filling in that experience and understanding it from um, a wider, a bigger lens. Um, the other thing about uh, sharing the experience in um, a place like therapy is that you're sharing it in a way that's being witnessed and a validating witnessed kind of situation. You're not doing it alone. It's really important to have a place where you're able to share experiences and not be alone because the initial experience of victimization is one where you're all alone, right? And your resources are overwhelmed. And so you want to have a, a therapy experience of exploring what happened in a way where you're not overwhelmed and you're witnessed and you're cared for. So that's the second stage. And then the third stage is finding bigger meaning from the experience. So now that I've processed the experience and I've survived it and maybe I'm moving on a little bit, how do I incorporate this into the rest of my life? How do I make sense of who I am as someone who has experienced this? What is the what is maybe the bigger spiritual meaning I want to glean from it? Uh, what's the bigger political meaning? What 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 does this mean for the larger my larger life? It can often take some time to reestablish. I deserve to have boundaries. Um, I have a right to these boundaries. Boundaries are um, the sense of knowing this is what's right for me and this is not okay with me. It's, it's being able to listen to that little voice in our heads that say, huh, I don't like that, or that makes me uncomfortable, or what is that? And being able to pause, take yourself seriously, and then be able to state what you need and you want. The vast majority of people I see will come many years after the fact. They might have uh, tried to put the experience behind them. Um, maybe they've just kind of thought, I'll, I'll go ahead and live my life. Um, and then they might be realizing that there's after effects that are actually impacting them. They might be having you know, difficulties with concentrating in school or they might be having trouble in, um, in, another, in a relationship. They might have um, a number of kind of mood or anxiety issues that are arising. It's so normal that people would be experiencing after effects of trauma, but often people will wait quite a while until they just sort of feel like they're ready or they just, um, they feel like the trauma has been kind of holding them back. What should survivors of sexual assault or of any kind of trauma or somebody suffering from trauma, what should they look for in a therapist, in your opinion? The first thing is you need to kind of sit down with a therapist. Um, hopefully they'll have a free half hour where you can kind of meet them and just get a good feeling. Like you just want to trust your gut a little bit. Do I feel comfortable in this room? Do I feel comfortable with this person? Uh, you want to get a sense of their theoretical framework. Does it match your own perspectives? Do they believe that, that we live in a patriarchal society? Or do they believe that women should not wear short skirts? You want to get a sense of what, what's their, what are their beliefs? Um, and then what are the methods that they would use to talk about trauma? Have they had training? Do they understand that there are phases of trauma treatment? Have they had enough experiences working with people who have experienced trauma? Because if they're a beginner, they might do an okay job, but you, you want to 
you want to get more than an okay experience. You talked about having a theoretical framework. And for me, it was very important to have a feminist perspective when I thought about my own sexual assault. How do you think feminism itself can help victims of sexual assault? I think feminism is really central to doing therapy around any sort of violence against women sort of issue. I was talking early about anti-oppression and feminism really rolls into that. We really have to understand um, the experience of gender and gender identity in this society. We have to understand the history. We have to understand how patriarchy plays out in everyday life. It's incredibly important in psychotherapy work to understand that. When patients come to you with their experiences, do you encourage them to go to the police? Or what is your advice to them on tackling this oppressive legal and criminal justice system? I think it's really important for people to um, sort out how resourced they feel they are in terms of reporting, because um, the system, as you know, is really messed up. (laughs) So um, people need to sort out, like, do I have enough friends who are going to be there for me, who are going to be bringing me dinner, who are going to be available to talk to me in the middle of the night? Uh, Do I have money for legal supports? Uh, Do I have a community of support around me? So I would say if they're able to, if they're resourced enough, try to talk to someone soon after it's happened and talk to the right person and people. Um, That matters quite a lot, right? Because there are a lot of people who have such discomfort around these issues that they're going to be so invalidating and that's going to Uh, reinforce the trauma and make things worse. So it's really important that uh, whoever people speak to, they make sure that they're trauma-informed and anti-oppressive who are going to validate that it wasn't their fault, that they're not alone, that the experiences that they're having are are normal human coping strategies. Um, But they're not going to be pathologized for having normal symptoms and after effects from trauma. So I think that's that's the main thing is figuring out if you're resourced enough, if you have the energy to pursue this very difficult process that's going to unfold. And what do you think are the specific challenges victims of sexual assault are going to face in that difficult process once they decide to report or decide to speak publicly about their assault? I think the most broken part of the system is the culture that blames victims. So I see that there can be value, but I also see that it can be a soul-crushing experience. What ends up happening is that people aren't believed, first of all. Um, They're blamed for being in the situation. They're blamed for what they were wearing and so on and so on. So I think it's, it's this culture that doesn't understand what rape looks like, how prevalent it really is, and how it impacts victims. In every um, point of the disclosure, you can experience some really horrendous stuff. So you might tell a friend who blames victims, hopefully that doesn't happen to you, or you might tell a family member who blames you, or you might tell a cop who blames you. And then when they enter into um, a legal or, you know, they go to the police, um, they're given a lot of misinformation. Um, they're, they're told that they shouldn't have been where they were. Um, if, they, if they go into a court system, they're in a situation where they have to prove um, that what they say happened really happened. Um, it's as though they are on trial. You know, we've all seen what happened at the Gian Gameshi trial, for example. And, you know, who would who would want to be in that situation? Who would want to be so disrespected and slut shamed in front of a huge audience in front of the media? I can really see why people would avoid that experience. When when you're already you're assaulted, and then you're assaulted by the court system, and the media, that's re-traumatization. So what that means is that all of your initial symptoms that you would have had will just come back, right? And maybe they'll come back worse. Often people will talk about how um, what the, the thing that was worse for them, the assault was bad enough, but then what was worse was everybody's responses after the fact, not being believed, being slut-shamed and so on. That, that's what sometimes feels like the deeper cut. So that, that requires a lot of resources, right? That requ- requires a lot of energy, a lot of resilience. 
and uh, some people have it and some people at the time in their lives when they're thinking about doing this they don't have it and that's okay too. This is the other problem, right? Sometimes the supports aren't available because there's long waiting lists and um, it costs quite a lot to uh, go to private pr practice therapy. So um, my role is to really support somebody's choices and um, check in with them about what kinds of supports they've got, um, how their self-care is going, to remind them that they live in a context where they are not being taken care of, that's very patriarchal, that's very victim blaming, so that they're, they're not absorbing those things, they're not internalizing those messages. So it's, it's um, helping them through the personal but also reminding them of the political. People sometimes form kind of new meaning from the experience as well. Once they've had enough opportunity to process the experience and grieve the experience and get angry about the experience, um, often people will find a kind of different meaning. They'll understand just how brave they are uh, and how strong they are as people. They might uh, realize that they can be supports to other people if that's available to them. Um, so it starts to become not just an experience of uh, victimhood, but it, it becomes an experience of survivorship and then thriving after that as well. So you mentioned that victims of sexual assault may go to friends and family as their first stop on disclosing sexual assault. How would you advise friends and family on how to support survivors that come to them? I think um, family and, and friends can maybe ask survivors what it is that they need um, because everyone is going to need something different. But it can be really difficult sometimes when people are going through hard times to reach out and ask for help. So sometimes it's really helpful for family and friends to ask, what is it that you need? Can I bring you dinner? Um, can I walk your dog? Can I clean your house? Uh, can I look after your kids? Can I... Um, sit here and listen to you. What is it that you need? It's very human to fall down, right? And then it's also human to be picked up and to stand up again. Um, but it's, it's how isolated we are that makes the experience worse or how resourced we are that makes the experience survivable. And we're, we're, interdependent creatures as human beings and so we we need a lot of help and so if we have that lot of help I think we do much better after an experience of trauma um, sometimes our friends and family can be really freaked out to hear our pain you know because they don't want to see us in pain and so they can start problem solving and talking us out of our feelings and we sometimes need to you know sh share articles with them about what does it mean to hold space and just listen what are some other kinds of things victims can do to pick themselves up, so to speak? So, If someone can access the public system where um, the, the, th the, se the sessions are going to be free, that's really, uh, I think, the optimal situation. So if you can get on waiting lists and be patient, that's great. Um, and then that'll be free. You might use um, a crisis line sometimes. Sometimes people will do a mixed approach. So they'll get on um, a waiting list and then they'll seek private uh, practice uh, therapists for that interim period of time. Uh, generally, people are charging anywhere between $100 to $150 per session, sometimes more, sometimes a bit less, depending on sliding scales. So that's, that's what you can expect um, per session. I think that survivors cope in all kinds of ways because we're all different. So sometimes we cope in ways that are perhaps less healthy um, I think that's a very human experience that we do all kinds of things to distract ourselves. And then there's all kinds of other um, coping strategies that might be considered to be more healthy. There are some really uh, good books that people can read that can help to normalize their experiences. I think that, again, like it's the normalization, it's the validation of the experience. It's really important. So people might go on online and go in public forums. Of course, there's some risk to that because they may or may not get support and good advice. You know, often you'll see underneath a really great article all kinds of slut shaming comments. So that's that's perhaps a negative part of the internet and social media. But I think generally, um, these are places that can provide more information to victims and survivors. It's really important, though, not to do this kind of healing on your own. I think it I think 
healing from trauma really requires doing it through relationships. So if you can find somebody in your life who um, is able to just hold space for you, and you might need to talk to them about what that means. You might say, holding space to me means just listening and not giving me any advice. Holding space might mean giving me advice. Holding space might mean um, letting me talk and cry for 15 minutes and then reminding me that I'm okay and that this is going to pass. Whatever it is, you might you might want to seek out somebody who uh, you think is just a really good listener and able to take your direction. They might read the book along with you. Um, you might You might sit together and read a chapter at a time together. But I think it's really important not to do it alone, to do it in a relationship with somebody else, a trusted friend, a good a family member, a partner. You might have some kind of peer support that you set up for yourself. It's really about having enough resources to get you through a really difficult situation. And we all need something different, right? So it can be anything from just developing better self-care, so sleeping better, eating better, exercising, to things like activism that can be really helpful as a coping strategy as well. The positive things is that people are able to put it into perspective, right? So they're able to say, this happened to me. This is a human experience, a really awful human experience that I've had. Um, I can see the ways that it's been impacting on me. I'm going to take a look at my coping strategies. I'm going to see if there's anything I want to uh, change in my coping strategies. Um, people might start to look at their boundaries and maybe some of their past boundaries. And uh, do they have a right to some new boundaries? For some of us, we just need to talk to you know a friend or a partner. And for others, we need to see a therapist. If someone can come on a really regular basis, say once a week for um, a, a period of time, I think that sometimes they get a better result than if they can't afford or they don't have the time to come as often. It's, it's really that therapeutic alliance, that relationship that gets formed, that, that experience of trust and validation that um, helps with some of the experience of healing. Because often people can never access therapy. And so what they're working with is their support network. So I think, I mean, I, th I think it's better if you can have therapy, but if you can't, make sure that your support networks are really well equipped to help you out. Uh, going through um, a situation where you're a witness at a trial, really requires a lot of resources. So make sure they're in place. You've supported uh, many victims through the reporting process and through the court process. In your opinion, having witnessed the whole system, what would you change about it? Or how could victims better go through this process? I think that private practice psychotherapy needs to be funded by the healthcare system so that People have um, a lot of options and they can choose whether they want to seek their care from a hospital-based setting or a social service setting or a private practice setting. The other piece of it is that sometimes what people will tell me when they go into the public system, and the public system is not well resourced, so um, sometimes people experience oppression from the service providers that they're seeking. And then, you know, all the people who are part of the system that exists today, right, what I just said is a more idealistic sort of thing, but the system that, it, that exists right now, everybody needs to be educated about what it means to support victims and survivors. So if um, you're in school and you need to speak to your residence advisor, that residence advisor needs to be really educated so that they know what they're supposed to say and not say, right? They need to know what their silences even mean. Maybe all of us as members of society need to be educated about this so that we're available to help with that resourcing that needs to come later for a victim. Uh, we need to uh, teach people of all genders about consent culture. You know, what does it mean to really respect each other, um, especially in sexual situations? What does it mean to ask for a person's consent. How do we do that in a way that's sexy? Um, so I think that's where it really needs to start is through that kind of education. Well, thank you so much for speaking with us today, Farzana. It's been a true pleasure. And for those of you interested to learn more about Farzana, you can visit her website at www.farzanadoctorpsychotherapy.com. 
And that's doctor just like a regular doctor would be spelled. And she also has a blog on there with a lot of great resources. And we'll include that link in the show notes uh, for this episode. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. My pleasure. And again, you can find all the details on streaming Slut or Not the Diary of a Rape Trial on organizing a screening or ordering a DVD on our website at www.slutornut.ca. Thank you for listening. <laughs>